here we are. Um, so I put up on the board all the things that need to be done at this point. All right. I'm sure. Oh, I did open it, right? All right. Just what's left at this point. Okay. So remember, you got one more quiz. Now, I don't necessarily recommend putting it off until tomorrow night because I think tomorrow night y'all will be probably studying for this exam, but you do whatever crazy things you want to do. Okay? So then, remember there are two parts that need to be completed. All right? The unit 4 exam, which is the same as the other unit exams, and then there's a cumulative test. All right? the, I, I can't even remember what it's worth. I have it written on positive in the syllabus. Right? Let me quick see. It is worth Less than the cum or less than the exam itself. Yeah, there it is. So uh, the the cumulative exam is fifty questions worth fifty points. All right. So it's a pretty straightforward, and you can't study for it per se. So I definitely would put your time on this one. It's it's going to incorporate things that came throughout the entire semester. Maybe obviously put the majority of your time into the actual unit four exam. But maybe just skim through kind of the highlights on some of that stuff. Kind of just make your brain reactivated. <coughs> reactivated. Something like that. Okay? And then obviously then the final thing would be the uh, that last study guide. All right? So... Although next year I may be changing that rule. Well, that's going to have to be somebody else's problem. Yes, it is. <laughs> that is somebody else's problem. So anyway, I, I just that I am thrilled that the grades are because usually my problem in general psychology is not being able to create an exam that any that, that I can get an average higher than sixty five. I just can't. And all of a sudden this semester I'm like, okay, oh wow. It's all the studying. Huh? I'm sure it's studying. I'm 100 percent positive. What else would it be? What do you think we're, we're, we're I'm not implying anything. I'm suggesting <laughs> there might be other factors involved, but we'll see. Okay. Big problem study groups now. However, you stick around and become a psych major, then we'll have a different question. Okay. So apparently we don't have a screen today, so we'll do the best we can with this board. Okay. So finally, after all of this, we finally get into therapy. Oh my God, didn't you want to do therapy the entire semester? Become a psych major, take counseling with doctor. He's in the room next door, all right, doing counseling right now. So I don't know, I had to take a counseling class as an undergraduate, and I got an A in it, but I can tell you that, um, Basically, I was told by the people before me, when it's the day when you do role play, you cry. All right, you cry when you role play, like you really get oh. Then <laughs> you get it. It's like sweet, I got it. All right, so we're going to talk about therapy very briefly, obviously. Um, but clearly, in order to help us to understand therapy, we need to start out reminding ourselves what we already sort of talked about. The, the different ways that people view mental illness. Remember the supernatural approach to mental disorders, the psychological approach to mental disorders, and the biological approach to mental disorders. Because clearly the 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 theory, the process the way that you view mental disorders will influence the way that you it put therapy. I mean, if you have beliefs that mental disorders are caused are supernaturally caused by you know, infestation with demons. Well, then clearly treatment is going to be involved Get rid of demons, right? It's pretty straightforward, okay? And so, yeah, look at that. That's exactly what some of the earliest forms of therapy were, okay? And so removing, you know, oh, this guy's got the stone of madness or something. I don't know what that is. It's a little freaky one. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, trefining, they called this, that they would, they would cut a hole in the skull and to let the spirits out, okay? And what's crazy is they found plenty of skulls around that, that this has happened with where the person uh, clearly lived through the operation because the bone shows evidence of healing and 
They, they cut. So now they believed they were letting evil spirits out. But you know what? There was at least some truth to this. If you have swelling in the brain, it's going to cause psychotic symptoms. If you drill a hole in the skull, you're going to relieve a lot of that pressure, and the psychotic symptoms are going to be disappear, well, decreasing. And so you know what? It worked. All right? And well, whatever it could. But obviously other things like bleeding people and beating them, right? Like I said um, earlier, the idea was if you believe that a demon possession then make the body so unpleasant that a demon would not want to stay in the body. Okay? Get them out. Demon be gone. Okay? Philippe Pinel, as we said, the moral treatment movement and uh, the Sol Pitre Asylum in Paris, as, as I said, when Philippe Pinel was put in charge, um, he found that the mental patients were locked up in chains and stuff. And it, he was like, these aren't prisoners. They didn't commit a criminal act. Why are you locking them up in this criminal fashion? Okay? And so he, he let them go. He just released the chains. He treated them like human beings. Okay? Housed them in hospitals rather than locking them in an asylum. Okay? Treat them with tenderness, not harshness. All right? So it was really the moral treatment movement which led to the idea of psychotherapy. Okay? We find, <clears throat> perhaps today, I guess, uh, in the United States, mental health treatment is actually kind of sad. Because what happens is uh, your best interest in, in uh, psychological treatment is not being driven by your best interest. It's being driven by how can the insurance company spend the least amount of money, okay? And so what happens is that, in a, you know, for somebody with severe mental disorders, they should probably be seeing a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist is somebody that gets a medical degree and then specializes in psychiatry, okay? It's a specialization, just like any other specialization, but first and foremost has a medical degree. Somebody with severe mental issues that would be best served by going to a psychiatrist very often cannot go to a psychiatrist because they are expensive. They have a medical degree, therefore they cost more money. And the insurance company, most insurance, uh, health insurance, will have separate plans. It will be like, here is your physical treatment money, here is your mental treatment money. And the mental treatment money is pretty low, all right? And every plan is different, but it could be $10,000 a year capped, maximum of $10,000. If you go to a psychiatrist, it'll probably be over $500 bucks an hour, okay? Most likely over $500 an hour. So you got a cap of ten grand for the year. How much treatment can you really get across the course of a year if you're going in at $500 plus an hour, okay? Not very much. So maybe what's going to happen is you're going to go to a clinical psychologist. A clinical psychologist will have a doctorate, but not a medical doctorate. They will have a doctorate in psychology, and then with, uh, special, with, with emphasis on, on uh, medical aspects of it. And so what you find is in some states, and this has been another push, some states, the only people that can prescribe psychiatric medication is a psychiatrist because they have a medical degree, therefore they have the training. But the insurance companies do not like that because that means any patient that needs to get any prescription has to be paying 500 plus an hour. You see what's going on here? And so the insurance companies have been pushing for years to allow non-medical people to prescribe, okay? And um, it's, it's something, it's, it's a trick. And so then uh, you've got psychiatrists at the top as far as, as expense, okay? Then you've got clinical psychologists. Below there you will have a therapist or a counselor, okay? Something of this nature. Therapists and counselors have gotten much better in the last handful of years. When I was in college, if you wanted to be a therapist, here's what you do. You put a sign on the door that says therapist, and if you can convince people to pay you, you're good to go. Okay? But now it's pretty regulated. All right? In order to be a licensed counselor in the state of Texas, and I don't know, there is 
quite a few hurdles. You must have a minimum of a bachelor's degree. You must have done this much experience, this much, etc. They have they have pretty pretty high burden though, and I'm happy they should have a high burden. Right? But below a counselor or something, then you've got what uh, pastoral counseling. Okay, and see what's happening is that people that should be seeing a psychiatrist are seeing clinical psychologists. People that should be seeing a clinical psychologist are seeing therapists. People that should be seeing a therapist are seeing a pastoral counselor. Okay, you, you see the problem here? And it's the, ins it's, it's the insurance companies are, and, I mean, I got it. They got to they gotta make a profit and everything, but it's pretty, it's pretty brutal, okay? And that was actually a huge fight in Obamacare was, you know, should we, uh, you know, should we make physical health insurance and mental health insurance separate should be, you know, do you have a right to mental health treatment? I mean, it's, it's rough, okay? So what we find is um, of the homeless in shelters, about a quarter have a severe mental illness. Um, correctional institutions also have a huge number of people with mental illness, okay? So the fact is a whole hell of a lot of people that should be getting treatment are either getting Terrible treatment or getting no treatment. Okay, it just is, and I mean, it, it the burden on it's just so expensive. It's so difficult. Um, I've I've had some experiences here, and it's like I would like a an appointment. Okay, that will be six months from now. Okay, six months from now. On. Um, yeah. All right, moving on. So there's two, two kind of uh, ways that you can break up therapy. People that have more of a psychological approach to mental disorders tend to advocate for psychotherapy. Those that have a medical approach to mental disorders tend to advocate for biomedical therapies, tend to, tend to. But what's probably more uh, uh, common is this eclectic approach, where it's going to kind of take some medical and some uh, psychotherapies and kind of work together. And so, you know, some people criticize psychiatrists because psychiatrists kind of say, you have a problem? I got a quick solution for you. It's called drug. All right? Take this drug. You take this drug and all your problems will be solved. Okay? And so, some in the more uh, psychotherapy view think that is a short-sighted solution. Okay? That it is often found that the best solution is some type of a biomedical treatment combined with the psychotherapy. Okay. Oh my God, Dr. Marvin Monroe. You know this guy? I got him in my office too. He's pretty awesome. Okay. So anyway, <clears throat> what is therapy? Uh, well, here's the original psychotherapy, Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was a, um, a uh, what am I saying? He was a neurologist, okay? And he had patients that were coming in, and they had what he called glove anesthesia. So they, you know, I can't feel anything in my hand, all right? There's nothing in my hand. And it was a common, common problem. But because he was a neuro, uh, neurologist, he knew that there is no physical way you could have the symptom of Glove anesthesia. It is not physically possible. Okay? And so that led him to believe that you could have a manifestation of a physical symptom from a psychological cause. Because there is no way this can happen. It is not possible. Okay? So he puts together his theory of personality. And um, very briefly, we had mentioned him earlier. But remember, the personality is composed of three parts. When a child is born, they're born with an id, and the id is the gimme, gimme, gimme stuff, right? It's impulsive, it's selfish, give me, I want it. As the child gets older, they develop a second part of their personality, the ego. And the ego's job is to sort of regulate the id's impulsive desires, right? So it kind of shuts down the id. And then finally, the superego, which is sort of uh, learned through interaction with society around us, which kind of also helps to regulate the id. And so according to Freud, I mean, the, the personality is like an iceberg. This is what we see, this is the truth, okay? All of this stuff is down there. 
And so his view was this unconscious here. These things down here, even though they're below this level, they're outside of our awareness, but they can still affect us. Okay? They're still there and they're still going to impact the way we, we respond. Okay? So yeah, we start life with the id, the ego develops based on the reality principle, and later on the superego, some kind of a morality. So if you remember this little analogy, right, here is the id, and the id saying, get, you know, I want it, I want it, I want it. And here is the superego, little angel, going, no, 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 we don't do those things. And remember, the ego is the one that sits in the middle that's supposed to sort of try to keep both the id and the superego happy. Okay? The id says, I want it, I want it, I want it. The superego goes, whoa, no, 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 we don't do those things. And so if you recall the example we gave earlier with like, you know, the id says, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, she's got a candy bar, smash it, take it, take it, eat it, you know? And the superego goes, no, we do not break rules like that. That is not how we behave. And so the ego's job in the middle is to go, I got it, I got it. I'll pull out my wallet, take a buck, go down to the candy machine, buy a candy bar. My id's desires are met. I've satisfied the superego's demands. Okay, you see, you see the idea. That's what an ego is supposed to do: make them all happy. But in certain cases, there is no solution. Okay, remember one of the classics was um, when little boys are growing up, they develop a desire for mom. Remember that? The um, Oedipal complex. And so the id is going, I want her, I want her. And the superego is like, no, no, you know, do that shit. And the ego just, the ego doesn't know what to do. Okay? And so what happens according to Freud is when we, when we have this, that we feel anxiety. Okay? Anxiety is what we feel when the ego is like, I got the, the id here screaming stuff. I got the superego screaming. I don't have a solution. So one of uh, Freud's famous quotes, anxiety is the price we pay for civilization. Okay? And so the key behind this is that it, it's a good thing. This means that your id is not doing its impulsive stuff. You see that? That's what, it, that's what that is. Okay? And so when the anxiety arises, the ego uses what they call defense mechanisms. Okay? The ego will then take that anxiety-inducing thought and <coughs> shove it down below the level of the conscious mind. It's down in the unconsciousness. But remember, just because it's down there doesn't mean it's all on. All right? Because all that crap that gets shoved down there starts to filter up. And the ego has to actively hold it down. Okay? Actively. And so what happens is, uh, and the biggest, by the way, there's a... Freud had a ton of different defense mechanisms. The, the biggest one is repression, right? To repress it, make it go away. But what he said was that um, uh, he, that you can get at, though the ego is trying to hold that stuff down, sometimes what's going to happen, let's say, for example, when you're dreaming, okay? When you're sleeping, your ego is kind of relaxed, and therefore all of that crap that got shoved down is going to come up in your dreams. All right. So maybe what's going to happen is um, slip of the tongue. You know, sometimes you're talking and you accidentally say the wrong word. Yeah. You know, just the other day, somehow I referred to my daughter as my mother. It was a little weird. Okay. And according to a Freudian, that's like. I don't know what they actually were feeling, but it's super creepy no matter how I define it, right? <laughs> but, um, so what's going to happen is if you can catch the ego when it's not, when it's not actively holding the stuff down, you can access all that stuff that's down in the unconscious mind, okay? You can get at it, okay? And so, say for example, interpretation. So the therapist is talking to the, to the patient and and all of a sudden realizes, oh, um, this patient won't talk about his father, right? So maybe that's where the problem lies, you know? And so the therapist's job is to figure out what is going on, right? Resistance, dreams, transference, 
So maybe, you know, the relationship between the therapist and the patient and the significant relationships in the patient's life will be put onto the relationship with the therapist, okay? So um, I, I honestly cannot express enough how much I believe Freud is full of shit. I, I cannot. Um, I was in Vienna a couple of years ago, Vienna, Austria, and one of the things they had is the Sigmund Freud Museum, okay? So my wife wants to see architecture and crap. I'm like, okay, that's boring shit. So I sent her off. I went off to the Sigmund Freud Museum, all right? Now, I am not going to pay to enter that museum because that's just, you know, you're paying the end. I'm not doing it, okay? But I got a great picture of me right at the museum. Ho, ho, right? I took that one. I got it. I got it, all right? Just, just say it. And then coming back from the Sigmund Freud Museum, back to wherever my wife was, I had to go to Sigmund Freud Park, all right? And you know what they were having at Sigmund Freud Park? They were having a wiener festival. <laughs> in, in German, uh, the name for Vienna is Wien, W-I-E-N. And so a wiener, or they would pronounce a wiener, would be a person that lives in Vienna. So it was, a, you know, it was celebrating the city, but as an American, it was wiener festival. And I tried so hard to get the picture where it had the Wiener Festival sign <laughs> and Sigmund Freud Park. I, there was no angle I could catch the two at the same time. <laughs> oh, that was glorious. And so now, what happens now in, in psychoanalysis is this. You're having problems. You're manifesting psychological. Um, in fact, one of the biggest things is, is, is he did most of his early work with um, women. All right, women that were experiencing hysteria. Have you ever heard the word hysteria? It's an old term for basically crazy. And uh, the, it comes from the Latin word hyster, which is uterus. And the idea was hysteria comes because women have uteruses. <laughs> I'm not making it up. I'm just telling you the past, okay? I did not say that. And so what happens is you're having problems. You don't know why you're having problems, and the reason is it's down here. The therapist, <clears throat> psychiatrist's job is to figure out what's going on down here, using resistances, dreams, etc. And what you should do essentially is find all of these sources and just rip them out. I mean, reveal them. It's almost like the goal of psychotherapy, uh, psychoanalysis is like an emotional vomiting, all right? To find all of the crap in the unconsciousness and just whoosh, and it'll be the most painful experience you can have because it's all gonna come out in one shot. But once it's out, you should be pretty much gone, all right? You should be good to go, right? So it's, I don't know what to say to you. I, I'm just moving on. Well, it turns out that psych traditional psychoanalysis takes years and years and years with a psychiatrist, which we've already determined is incredibly expensive. So clearly, traditional psychoanalysis is for the super rich, okay? The super rich people. So instead, psychodynamic therapy attempts to take the ideas from traditional psychoanalysis and speed up the process, okay? So rather than, see, in traditional psychoanalysis, the, the, the physician kind of sits back and is, is just passively listening to what the patient says. In more of a psychodynamic therapy, the, the physician is much more active, is speeding up the process. Rather than waiting for it, they'll make some, some leaps and some jumps to, to make it happen faster. But ultimately, it's the same basic idea is to just get some kind of an emotional vomit, to just woof it all out. Okay? To just do it faster. Okay? Um, behavior therapy. So we're completely switching up, switching gears with behavior therapy. And behavior therapy is 100% built on the, the principles of learning. And it all came from John Watson. Okay? And John Watson, you know, remember John Watson um, from uh, classical conditioning with baby Albert? Poor baby scared the shit out of the baby, and then the baby is afraid of rats. And yeah, so he basically says something pretty powerful. He says, and you know, the majority of negative behaviors that people exhibit as adults is a product of learning. You learn 
remember something. You've got a bad association for it, okay? You're afraid of bees. Why are you afraid of bees? Because when you were a kid, your mama started screaming when she saw a bee. And you're like, now you associate bees with fear, all right? And so it's just bad learning. You got it? So anything that can be learned can be unlearned. Got it? That's the whole principle of, beha of uh, behavioral therapy, right? Behavioral therapists think the problem is, the behavior is the problem. You've got a little boy, and the boy is starting fires. Traditional psychoanalysis, let's find out why you're doing this, and what is the root cause of your, and the behavioral therapist goes, the problem is the kid starts fires. If I can make this kid stop starting a fire, problem is solved, okay? The symptom is the problem for behavioral psychologists, okay? Behavioral therapy. All right, so we refer to this thing called counter-conditioning. And so as we say, anything that can be learned can be unlearned, right? Remember the, when we, were learn, we did the learning chapter, they used the word conditioning, and whenever we saw conditioning, we had to think that meant learning. Counter the learning, right? You know, counter means to like flip or to change or to the opposite or something like that. And so opposite learning. Basically, okay? You're conditioned to fear stores because you've had panic attacks. You could be brought into a store, taught to relax, relax, relax. And now instead of the store is associated with a panic attack, the store is associated with relaxation. Uh, you see what you're doing? You're simply just changing the associations that are out there. The original study, the, the classic study was, was Peter. Peter was afraid of all kinds of crazy shit, including rabbits, okay? And so Peter absolutely loved peanut butter sandwiches. So they put up a cookie because I guess that sells better. They were peanut butter sandwiches, okay? And so then what happens is you give Peter the peanut butter sandwich and the rabbit. And at first, Peter is a kind of freaked out because there's a rabbit. But pretty soon, the rabbit didn't in fact kill you, so he relaxes enough to eat the peanut butter sandwich. Okay? And once he does, now all of a sudden, he is comforted. And so instead of rabbit is associated with fear, rabbit is associated with comfort. Right? So counter the learning. Right? I like it. Versions of expo of uh, behavior therapy, okay? Because sometimes, in fact, they, they, again, didn't tell the entire story because what happened with Peter was on the first day they brought him in and he's sitting here with his peanut butter sandwich and the rabbit is in a cage on that end of the room. And Peter's kind of annoyed and kind of bothered by it, but it is all the way over there and he eats the sandwich. The next day they moved the rabbit three feet closer, peanut butter sandwich, rabbit, but now until they moved it closer, 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 closer. So they did not just smack him with a rabbit, right? That's kind of ruthless. And so that's a version of systematic desensitization, okay? So instead of taking the thing that you're so deathly afraid of and just whipping it in your face, let's take tiny little baby steps to get there, okay? Small steps towards it. And at each step, the idea is, at each and every step, you do not remove the rabbit until his fear has dissipated, right? Because the whole idea is you need, it was rabbit is associated with fear, we now just need to change to rabbit is associated with calm, relaxed, and pleasant, okay? So, good stuff. Uh, sometimes virtual reality is used in, uh, in cases, uh, they're using virtual reality theory, uh, therapy a lot in uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, for sure. But you can then, in a safe environment, expose people. It's a, you know, it's, it's related to systematic desensitization. So baby steps to get to the thing you're afraid of. Okay. Offering conditioning can be used also in therapy situations. I mean, the simplest one is a token economy, and in a token economy, which was actually they were used pretty prevalently in, in uh, mental hospitals. What you do is the patients in a mental hospital. Uh, just because you cured them, you cured them, all right, doesn't mean they're ready to go out. 
because many people have been institutionalized nearly their entire life, and so even if they're cured, you put them out on the street and they're like, I don't know how to pay a water bill. What are you, what are you kidding me? What, how am I gonna function in an apartment on my own when I've never been asked to make my own food? And I've never been asked to, you know, I, I don't know these things. And so what you do is in an institution, while institutionalized, you use a token economy to, uh, to promote, promote those behaviors that people will need to exhibit when they leave the institution. Okay? Uh, there is a lot of criticisms to token economies, but the fact is token economies can modify behaviors, right? I mean, we use these in grade schools all the time. I mean, how many sticker charts did you have when you were in second grade, right? Or prize buckets, or I mean, my daughter's grade school bucket filler tickets, right? They're trying to promote good behaviors. And you were caught being good today. I love that. You know what you get if you're caught being good? You get a bucket filler ticket which you get to proudly walk down to the office and you tell the secretary and receive a free ice cream coupon. Then you put the ticket in the bucket, all right? And at the end of the week, they draw a name and whoever is lucky enough gets to read the Friday morning announcements. That's the prize for being good. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? However, behavior modification is also sometimes used. I watched a very interesting video one time of a, a profoundly mentally retarded man. I mean, we're talking an IQ of like 15, okay? This person cannot function in any way, shape, or form, will be 100% institutionalized. This person, for whatever reason, uh, inflicted self-harm, all right? Constantly would, would poke and break the skin, just always breaking the skin. And uh, in fact, it was so bad that that uh, that this guy would even take like, um, this is a, a different age, the aluminum foil from a cigarette wrappers, and he would roll it into a really sharp point and, and jam it through his skin. So this guy had to literally be strapped to a bed all day long, all right? That, that's this guy's life, strapped to a bed. A behavioral psychologist walks in and says, you know what, we can modify this behavior. And so what they did was they, they, they identified something that he loved. He loved cold coffee. I don't know why, but this dude loved cold coffee. And so what they would do is they put a, a uh, cigarette wrapper on the table, and then they, they waited until he, he didn't touch that cigarette wrapper for 10 seconds, and then they gave him coffee. And then eventually they made him wait 20 seconds without touching him, gave him coffee. So every time he would reach for it, they would move his hand back, right? And if you would reach for it, move your hand back. So you gotta go 10 seconds without reaching for the cigarette wrapper, you get cold coffee. 20 seconds, you get cold coffee. And so they raised the standard up and up and up, and pretty soon this, this, this patient was no longer inflicting self-harm, and to the degree possible, he now has the freedom to do, I don't know what freedom you're gonna have, but I mean, you're not strapped to a bed every day. So, pretty pretty clear. Some people find this to be incredibly offensive because it's treating human beings as though they're some kind of a mechanistic machine rather than individuals with human rights. It sort of takes away dignity as a belief. But if the alternative is to be strapped to a table 24 hours a day, I think that that's not a bad alternative, okay? Another behavioral modification I, I heard one time, actually it was hilarious, they had a patient at a hospital that had a, a, a problem with hoarding, all right? They, they would hoard towels. So every day that it would, they would go in and they would take another towels, a couple of towels. And so what they did was they used something that's called flooding. And so every day, this patient was boarding towels, but they would bring a pile. Here you go, I, I see that you really like towels, so here's some towels. Oh my God, the greatest thing this guy could ever imagine. And on the second day and the third day, and the was like, I don't need these towels, why, why are you giving me these towels? And they stopped his behavior by flooding him with the thing that he was doing. Right? So lots of different techniques.
Um, so you got the classical condition, you got the operant condition, and then of course social learning, which is the third major type of learning. And so you find uh, modeling. In modeling, what's going to happen, and there's different versions of modeling, but um, where the therapists themselves will model the behavior in front of the patient. So if a patient is deathly afraid of snakes, then the therapist will literally hold the snake, interact with the snake, show the patient, look, I'm not panicking, there's no anxiety involved, something like that. Um, symbolic modeling, again, this could be on a video rather than in person. Um, we find graduated modeling, and again, this would be like, first the therapist um, you know, is touching a picture of a snake, and then the therapist is in the room with the snake, and then the therapist is touching the snake, and then the therapist is, I don't know, wearing it in a weird fashion or something. Okay? Participant modeling is uh, obviously, you know, the best, where uh, clearly you're going to get the patient themselves to uh, interact with the feared object. Okay? But one that I find fascinating to me is videotape self uh, modeling. And so what's going to happen is you have a patient with a problem, and some of the things that they did, maintaining good posture, walking, balancing, writing, dressing, I've even uh, stu uh, stuttering, fidgeting. I've even heard like picks. You know, some children get one of these things, okay? What you do is you videotape a child, and then you edit the video to remove every single one of the ticks. And so the child then watches a video of themselves not performing that behavior, all right? And it's pretty impressive because um, one of the clearest principles we learned from social learning theory was that children will imitate people that are more similar to themselves, okay? And who is more similar to yourself than literally yourself, right? So that's uh, pretty good, pretty good. Um, and it's pretty impressive. And apparently it's watching the tape and um, making the tape in the first place that were crucial. Okay. Cognitive therapies. Cognitive therapies, and again, so now we have psychoanalysis, we have behavioral therapy, and now we have cognitive therapy. Now cognitive therapy, um, though I will 100% tell you I am not up on my cognitive therapy. So I can just give you the incredibly but it, 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 it goes kind of like this. Bad shit happens to everyone, okay? Everyone fails tests. Everyone loses their cell phone. Everyone has a girlfriend dumped them. Everyone, everyone has this. But guess what? It's not the event. We talked about this in the stress chapter. It's not the event itself that necessarily is what counts. It's your interpretation of that. Remember that? It's the way that you perceive that event. So if you have a, 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 an exam in front of you, it's hard for everyone. It's up to you to interpret that. Is this something that I should just get my stuff on, get it done, or is it something that's overwhelming to me? Okay? So in some kind of a way, you're in charge of interpreting. Shit happens. I can't stop it. Bad things will happen to you. That is not something I can remove. You will have that, but you can make some decisions. I failed the test, I must be stupid. I failed the test, you know what? I can do better. Okay? Guess which one leads to clinical depression and which one doesn't. And so cognitive therapy essentially um, it, it, it new adaptive ways of thinking. All right? This is depression, this is not. A version of uh, therapy is to combine cognition with behavioral. Okay, so it's again, it's more of an eclectic kind of an idea. So put the two together. So cognitive behavioral people with OCT are led to resist the urge to act behavioral, as well as to learn to manage obsessional thinking cognitive. Okay, so you've got the two different components working together as a therapy. And now, humanistic therapy. I'm, again, many people have criticized
criticize humanistic therapy because it's, it's lack of scientific rigor. And the founders of humanistic therapy said, we never pretended it was science. So I'm not sure why you're criticizing us for being non-scientific when that wasn't our goal and we never claimed we were. Okay. All right, so humanistic psychology, um, a variety of things happens in humanistic therapy, right? And um, I guess the, the, the one I like to, it comes out of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We, we talk about that in motivation, we talk self-actualization. And remember Abraham Maslow says, all human beings, when they're born, they're born with a purpose. And what happens is we're motivated to achieve that purpose, right? Remember he drew it like this, here's self-actualization, but here are like physical needs, here are like social needs, whatever it was, da, 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 da. and if these are not met, you will not move up, right? And so everybody is born with a purpose, and you will only get here if you meet these needs. Got the idea there? So I like the way that um, Carl Rogers puts this together. He says, human beings are like acorns. Okay? You know, acorns are the, 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 the seed which grows into an oak tree. Okay? So human beings are like acorns. Everybody is born with a potential, with a purpose, with a reason for existence. The reason this acorn exists is to become an oak tree. Okay, pretty straightforward. But what happens if that acorn is dropped into a gravel field? Maybe that acorn will sprout, maybe a couple of branches, but it won't be this wonderful, glorious thing, now will it? Okay. So we're all born with this potential to become an oak tree, but if you're put into a bad environment, you'll never show that, that potential or what you're supposed to become. Okay? And so in humanistic therapy, the idea is if you do not have a healthy environment, usually that means your home, right? Usually that means there's some shit going on at home, like parents that are hypercritical, I don't know what it might be, right? Your home life is messed up. And so the goal is to create an environment with, um, that, to help this. See now, number one, they do not call people in humanistic therapy patients. They do not call them that. Using the word patients implies that there's an illness, all right? And the key is there is no illness here. You simply are being, something is interfering with your ability to express your maximum potential, all right? And so the goal is to provide an environment where the, um, in fact, in the, the, an environment with what, what unconditional positive regard, that's my favorite word, okay? Um, emp a, 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 an empathetic relationship, genuine. So the idea is in, so many people's homes, okay? They don't have genuineness, all right? That is genuine, you know, genuine, like, be truthful, all right? I mean, you do not have to smile all day long in, in humanistic therapy, all right? If you're sad, then let's talk about that, all right? Let's, let's grab it, let's accept it. Unconditional positive regard, okay? I may not, have, may not approve of the behavior that you exhibited, but you're still a person that I still love you. Right, that it's, it, we're still okay, okay? Empathetic, all right? Uh, so the key is many people that are having problems, um, it's because they don't have a beautiful field to plant their acorn. Provide an environment where an acorn can bloom, all right? Provide the environment that they're not getting at home, all right? Um, it, it's more than this, active listening, um, the therapist shows that they are truly, I understand what you're saying, so your father was not around very much, all right? And it feels weird to me, <clears throat> but apparently this works, I don't know, it's just totally not my kind of thing, but I got it. But what I thought was actually kind of neat with humanistic therapy is the way that they approach are you getting healthy? So what we're going to do is we're going to have you describe your ideal self. Who is it that you want to be? All right? Second, let's talk about your actual self. All right? Who is it that you are? And there's a mis 
mismatch between those in most cases. And so as therapy progresses, the goal is to shrink these. Sometimes to bring this up, your actual self improved, but sometimes to look at your ideal self and say, maybe that's not a realistic option at this point, okay? And so if you can match your actual self and your ideal self, you should be perfectly healthy, okay? And again, it's not just improving you, but it's sometimes taking these ideals that you have that are not possible. As long as you have this goal in life, I'm going to do, but it's not going to happen, you will be miserable, okay? Let it go, all right? You will not do those things. So, that's all right, it's cool. All right, so different forms. Yeah, I wanted to move into that a little too. Um, in fact, I have that in the last section. Okay, so the biomedical therapies, as we said, um, there was this uh, recognition that there was a connection between biological things and psychological things when uh, people that had syphilis, if you get syphilis for years and years and years and you don't treat it, eventually you go crazy, okay? And so clearly, physical disorders can lead to psychological outcomes, absolutely, okay? And so that was really what made him think about it uh, in the first place. You find the most obvious of the biomedical therapies being drug therapy. Okay? So psychopharmacology, the study of drug effects on behavior, mood, and the mind. Um, we find that treatment drug therapies have been amazing. Uh, they have alleviated the mental health problems of so many people. But what happened was, see, here was um, the state and county mental health hospital residents. So you can see from 1900 up to here, 1950, clearly that this was a huge uh, positive, uh, trajectory on the rise. Okay? Then they introduced antipsychotic drugs. Okay? And look at that. There was, there was long-term mental health hospital. Because these are basically people with schizophrenia. That's pretty much what this is. And look at that. What happened, though, is all of these patients were no longer exhibiting symptoms, but remember, I already said it, they don't know how to, they don't know how to balance a checkbook. They don't, they don't know how to turn the water on to the water company. I don't know how to do that, you know? And so up goes, you know, down goes the patients in the mental hospital, and up goes the homeless population. All right? So there's a nice homeless population trend just to go right on top of it. We find that these antipsychotic drugs, uh, and I think I talked about tyrodite dyskinesia the other day, a common side effect, and one of the major reasons that uh, people stop taking medication that they should be taking because the side effects can be often worse than the actual disorder which you're taking the drugs for. Right? So there's some major categories of drugs. Antipsychotic, clearly used for schizophrenia hallucinations. And what they do is they basically block dopamine. And if you recall far, far earlier in the semester, I said, if somebody has high levels of dopamine, I predict they will be exhibiting symptoms of schizophrenia. If somebody is exhibiting symptoms of schizophrenia, I predict they have high levels of dopamine. If you block the dopamine receptors, you will reduce the schizophrenic symptoms. Sensible. Anti-anxiety, okay? It's going to uh, reduce thinking and physical agitation. Uh, it will not address the underlying problems. Okay. Uh, therefore, anti-anxiety medication by itself is not necessarily a solution. It is a band-aid. Right? And so anti-anxiety medication combined with more traditional psychotherapy might perhaps be a better solution. Okay? Antidepressants. And again, what's going to happen is the serotonin, and again, if somebody's serotonin level is low, I predict that they have symptoms of depression. Okay? So it's simply looking at the imbalance in the, in the neurotransmitters and doing something to bring them in balance. Okay? Mood stabilizers, this would in particular be uh, for um, uh, bipolar disorder. Right, bipolar, and uh, the, the, they're not exactly sure how, how these work. It's kind of a mystery. Nobody's 100% certain, all right? Or stimulants used for ADHD. 
to reduce distractibility, things of this nature. Um, yeah, decreased appetite. Wow. Now, perhaps a little bit more invasive. See, the thing is, is when it comes to drug therapies, um, if things aren't going so good, you can kind of stop, right? And you know, give it a couple weeks, and things go away. But now we're going to move into slightly more invasive stuff. ECT. It um, you take a patient here and you hook up electrical electrodes on the brain. Okay. Usually you give them a, a muscle relaxant first, and then what's going to happen is you're going to right into the brain, and it's, it, the person's going to go into convulsions. It's going to be seizures. Uh, then what's going to happen? See, and again. Nobody's 100% sure what's happening, but it appears that it rewires the neural structure. Okay? And it, it used to be used fairly commonly. Um, if anybody ever watched the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Jack Nicholson, oh, that's a good movie. It's a really good movie. With Nurse Ratchet, scary woman. Um, it, it, apparently was used in the past in mental hospitals as so almost like a threat. If you don't behave, you're going in for ECT. Okay? So nowadays, ECT has become quite rare. It is still used in certain cases of severe crippling depression. We're talking about people who cannot even get out of bed in the morning, who have no life because they have this depression. And what happens is, after getting a, a dose of ECT, uh, they lose one week of memory, approximately. Right? They can not remember a week before this event happened. And but then, usually for about six months, the depression gone. All right. So people that are in crippling depression are absolutely willing to take the cost of losing a week's memory. They're willing to do that. Uh, for what the benefits are. But you've got to be in some pretty bad shape to lose a week of your life uh, by doing that. A similar idea to ECT, which is uh, getting a little more traction, is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. And the same kind of a way that this seems to be rewiring, or it, it literally almost redirects the direction of the neurons. It's kind of an odd odd thing. Um, I, I've seen a slice of brain tissue from a patient right after ECT, and all the neurons are in a perfect line. So right? they just line up. But it's the, basically the same goal here that you're trying to realign the connections. But what you're doing is using magnetics instead of electricity, and you're um, being much more localized. Whereas ECT is going to zap the into indiscriminately, the entire brain gets zapped. Whereas in here, uh, it's much more localized to only one spot. Okay? So clearly fewer side effects involved. Right. On its furthest extreme, you can do psychosurgery. Now, this is like irreversible. Okay? Once this happens, it's over. And so lobotomies were again used in mental hospitals almost as a threat. All right? If you don't behave, there's only one solution, lobotomy. All right? Lobotomies, what happens is that you, you disconnect the frontal lobes from the rest of the brain, and it will lead to extreme calm behavior, a patient that is now incredibly calm. Now, if you're working in a mental hospital and you have a couple of patients that are just super aggressive and super violent, and super disruptive, you can imagine how tempting it might be to use this as a way to make your job easier. <laughs> Somewhere in the 1940s, um, there was a guy who discovered a way to perform a lobotomy with literally an ice pick. An ice pick is inserted into the corner of the eye socket, and doop, 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 and it's like a 10-minute procedure, and the lobotomy is done. Okay? Originally, lobotomies were like an entire major procedure, got to cut the head open, got to do everything. So this guy gets this. He wins a Nobel Prize in medicine for inventing a procedure to perform a lobotomy in eight minutes. And you don't need 
heavy medical training. All right, just about anybody can learn how to do this in just a couple of minutes. And whoo! So it feels to me something as extreme as a lobotomy ought to not be easy, right? You ought to make it a difficult thing to do. That so that you really think hard: is it necessary? Okay. Uh, now lobotomies pretty much are, aren't going to happen anymore. I'm sure there's still a couple. I don't, you know, I don't know why they would do it anymore. Microsurgery is perhaps more uh, common. So somebody with obsessive compulsive disorder, you might be able to disrupt a very specific aspect in the brain and slice it, and now all of a sudden that association and connection is no longer there. Okay. Uh, some other other ones actually that are not surgery per se. Uh, one, one of them with with good promise is people with post traumatic stress disorder. What you do is uh, you have them, whatever the stressful event is that's, that's triggering the PTSD, you activate it, bring it to the front of your memory, you think about it, you concentrate on it, and we will give you medication that is designed to inhibit your ability to store memories, okay? They have these things. And so you have this inhibition of memories and Remember, with memory, you activate a memory and then you put it back. And remember, it becomes a different memory. Remember that whole thing? So imagine that. You pull up the traumatic memory, you give a person a drug to block memory formation, and so when they go to put back that memory, it will be a partial memory now. Not the whole memory, because you've inhibited it. Repeat about five times, and pretty soon, that the memory that's triggering your PTSD ought to be gone. So that's some kind of cutting edge stuff right now. So treatment modalities, right? We find that um, sometimes, as we said, sometimes individual therapy with one patient, one therapist is good, right? Very possible. But what you find is, um, number one, that's expensive. Got it? Because it's... Uh, the entire cost of the treatment is on, the burden is on a single patient. If you do group therapy, it's first off less expensive, okay? But it turns out that sometimes, even though it's cheaper, for certain things, and, and again, going back to the PTSD, sometimes actually group therapy works better because what happens is not only are you a patient, but you are actually part of the therapeutic process for other people. You're helping other people get through their trauma. And so helping them through their trauma is also helping yourself. Okay? So though most of the time group therapy is all about the money, there are cases that it's better. Okay? We find self-help groups are the cheapest form of therapy there is, right? Because don't cost nothing. The group gets together with a pot of coffee and a couple of donuts. Family therapy, on the other hand, uh, Going back to what we said with the humanistic psychologist or the humanistic therapy, you know, you're an acorn and you're dropped into a, a gravel parking lot, like a bad home. How are you going to get this acorn to become an oak tree if you don't fix the home? Okay. So sometimes family therapy is used because it's a family environment that is in fact the problem. Okay. Um, so psychotherapy. Um, does it work? There was some, um, there's a lot of skepticism to this question. Does it do anything? All right. Uh, number one, people can get benefits from psychotherapy just by believing in it. All right. There is a placebo effect. All right. Um, we find a couple of things like, you know, what is the most common outcome? If you are in physical pain today, what is the most common outcome in a week? The pain will be less than it was. See, this is kind of just what happens, okay? And so I was in some conflict. I went to therapy. Now I'm feeling better. Therefore, the therapy is what made me feel better. Couldn't it have been the passage of time that made you feel better? And so there are some, some reasons to be skeptical about psychotherapy. Okay? If you ask a patient, are you satisfied? Three out of four say yes, okay? But I mean, again, this is social psychology. Can you imagine, you're like, I just spent all of this time and all of this money, and I don't think it did me any good. 
that's going to cause some problems here, okay? And you can't change the fact that you did all of this money and all of this time, but you can change your beliefs, okay? You can change what you think about it. And all of a sudden, they feel like, maybe it did help me. Now you feel good again. That was our cognitive dissonance, dissonance theory. And so now you feel okay again. So sometimes maybe people just deceive themselves so that they don't look like idiots. Wouldn't you be stupid if you just spent a shitload of money and then believe that it did you no good? <laughs> You'd be like, I am so stupid, okay? And you just change the way you think. Nine out of 10 patients report feeling better. Uh, therapists absolutely overestimate how effective they are. Um, you know what happens is if, a, if a patient is not working well with a psychotherapist, they disappear. They tend to disappear, okay? And maybe they're going to become a success for a different therapist. Maybe, maybe, okay? And guess what happens when a therapy client or patient is successful? They send you Christmas cards and pictures, you can put them all over your wall, but the ones that weren't successful just sort of, right? You get it? They're just kind of gone. So I don't know about this, okay? We'll see. Well, when they do a variety of different studies, what they found is, here is basically uh, a person that had problems and did not go to therapy. And so what happens is, of those people, if this is, you know, some are worse off, some are better off, here is the average patient that goes to psychotherapy. And again, they're not showing it, but there it is. And so some of these people with psychotherapy do worse, some do better. You see that? So there's a whole group in here. You see this? Well, here. Where they, they, they didn't benefit from psychotherapy. Got it? But the averages are right there. Okay? You see that? So there's lots and lots of cases where psychotherapy did not do squat. But on the average, it does. Huh? Um, there was actually uh, Hans Eysenck also he did some crazy studies he took people and these were average people, housewives and good people and he said okay what I want you to do is I want you to go into the emergency room and tell them you're hearing voices okay then every single person who went in and said this they got, they got put into the you know, institutional right? they all got admitted into the hospital and then they were instructed, now that you've been you know, admitted in the hospital, do not report any symptoms. None. Not a symptom. Okay? And try to get out of that hospital. All right? Let's see how long it takes. And it took like 23 days on average to get out. All right? With zero symptoms reported. All right? And the they average was like seven minutes a day with, uh, con and while hospitalized, an average of seven minutes a day with anybody associated with mental health treatment. Can you imagine you are hospitalized 24 hours a day, you get seven minutes interaction. Okay? That uh, patients were instructed to take notes and they said there was a lot of abuse going on, uh, a lot of issues, and then what would happen is that the medical staff would look at the patient's behavior of taking notes as a symptom of paranoia. Right? So, it, I, you can see why there's some skepticism to this question, does it work, all right? All right, well, there are some uh, alternative therapies out there, including, like, therapeutic touch. People believe that um, you have a balance. All right? It's like a yin and yang kind of a thing from like an Asian philosophy. Okay? And what happens is the universe needs to have a balance with a yin and a yang. And if you're out of balance, there's going to be a disruption. And it's the same thing with your body. If you're out of balance, then you're going to be ill. And so the job of a person with therapeutic touch is to sense your energy aura and to realign it. Okay? You got it? Realign it. A fifth grade girl here, nine year old, fourth grade girl, 
She, she thought this was a load of shit, so she wants to prove it's wrong. Because if I have an aura that you're going to balance, then look at this. I'm just going to put you in here, and therefore you should be able to tell where, you know, which hand am I holding mine over, right? Because you can feel my aura. She has like, cannot do it. 50-50, right? Half the time. Right? So you can't even sense my aura, yet you're going to use this notion of an aura as the basis of... All right, load of shit. Light exposure therapy actually does have some truth to it. And uh, the body needs, right, uh, in particular serotonin. Remember we said low levels of serotonin, depression. Turns out that in order to produce serotonin, your body needs certain raw materials, okay? And one of the biggest raw materials your body needs is sunshine. The vitamin D from the sunshine is one of the raw materials to create serotonin. Therefore, during winter months, that the um, rates of depression go up. And so what you do is you expose yourself to a very specific type of light that I don't know exactly what it is, <coughs> but in order to give you what you need to produce your serotonin. So there's the truth to that. And then finally here, when it comes to therapy, and I mean, we, we had this continually. If you recall, I, with uh, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and he describes self-actualization as the goal of life. And then he proceeds to describe self-actualized people. And he described himself. Remember that? <laughs> Western, white, male, you know, that's how he describes a good person. And so the idea is that's a natural tendency that we look to ourselves when we want, we've got a patient or a client here, and we want to evaluate, are they functionally healthy on a mental basis? And I will make that judgment based on my own personal culture and my own personal values. Okay? So it's been very, very controversial. Can a patient and a therapist from different cultures work together? Because it's just inevitable that the therapist will use their own cultural ideas and values for what equals psychologically healthy. Okay? So it's, it's pretty controversial about whether they can do this stuff. Okay? All right, so that's what we got. I'm hoping that um, you realize general psych is a hell of a lot more than you probably thought it was walking in the door. I'm guessing that's probably true, all right? And I apologize because the class has a lot of crap in it, okay? And I know it does, all right? Well, shit, that's just what's in it, right? I can't stop that. So uh, it's been a good class for those that are here, okay? Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's been a good class. So uh, maybe I convinced a couple of people to stick around and be a major. Whatever, maybe. Maybe I'll see them. So don't forget all of the things that still need to be done there.